Hey, Trevor, a lot of improvement from BYU against Southern Utah. Certainly some things to work on, notably the run game and whatnot. So uh, what stuck out to you about the week two performance from the Cougars? I, I hope they were looking ahead to Arkansas because <laughs> it, it started out so slowly. Now, they, they picked it up. They got the win. The passing game returned. All that was good, especially they got the win. They were better than week one. But goodness gracious, it, uh, it wasn't like I expected it to be after that performance against Sam Houston. What wasn't good enough in your mind? Well, they didn't run the ball well, did they? They didn't break 50 yards against an FCS school on the ground, even though it was an emphasis. And that, that worries me. Because it's one thing to come out slow in the opener. It's another thing to come out slow against an FCS team after the wake-up call of the opener. It seems like that has not been fixed yet. And that needs to get fixed, or this will be a very long season. You were fired up last week about the offensive line. Do you feel the same way, given the uh, ineptitude uh, in the run game? Yes, worse, actually. Uh, it's it's just watching them play, it's, um, I think, disappointing. I think they have the talent to be a lot better. It's one thing if you're just not good enough, or if the guy you're facing is just better than you. I've been in that situation plenty of times. But if if you're not playing up to your potential, no matter who's in front of you, then I, uh, I struggle with respecting that. And it appears that that's been happening. I know there's been some injury situations with a couple of guys that they've been playing through some things. I, I get that part. But there are things about the, this offensive line, the, the, the intensity, the drive, the, the what appears to be willingness to go out there, eagerness to go out there and smash people. It doesn't show up on tape. So if it's there, that's nice, but let's try to get it onto the field. Certainly they can work on that in practice and then apply it in the game. So what are you hoping happens in practice? And how did you and, and your teams get better in practice when you played at BYU and in the NFL? Jeremy, that's a great question because you can usually tell how a team practices by watching them in the game. For example, if a defense doesn't swarm to the ball in practice, they won't swarm to the ball in a game. It's a habit. And from a standpoint of offensive line, it doesn't look to me like they practice with a whole lot of intensity. Maybe they do, and it's just not getting into the game yet, but it doesn't look like they do. For example, this is just one example. When you go to throw a block and a, a pass is completed or a runner turns the corner and starts heading down the field, in practice, as an offensive lineman, as your defender leaves you, you need to sprint a couple of steps, just a couple of steps, with intent. That means you sprint towards the ball carrier. You look to make sure the ball hasn't been fumbled. It's not on the ground, so you can go jump on it. And then you look while you're sprinting those couple of steps for defenders that you can block downfield in case your ball carrier breaks a tackle. Now, you can only do it in practice for a couple of steps per play because an offensive lineman, you don't want to be running all these big, long sprints all day long. You'll wear yourself out. But I don't see that in the game. What I see is guys will lose their defender because he'll go pursue, and guys will just stop and watch the play. It, it just – and that, to me – speaks to practice habits. I don't know that. I want to be fair. I haven't been there. But if what they're doing in practice is not showing up in the game, then they better get that happening. And if they're not doing it in practice anyway, then they better darn well start. You know, you, you asked how we used to do it, you know, and I don't usually talk about back in the day, this is what we did. But practices were almost always harder than games. Our coaches, Roger French, Mel Olson, were two of the best offensive line coaches at any level. And I played 12 years in the NFL and they, they made sure that no stone was left unturned, unturned from a standpoint of assignment technique and intensity in practice. We got into the game. It was like, Hey, this is fun. Plus we had really good defensive players. Brad Smith was our nose guard and I had to fight like crazy in practice just so that he wouldn't embarrass me because he was an outstanding football player. And so there was great intensity in practice. You never took a single rep of a single drill off. You were going hard. And when you need to rest, the coaches make sure you had the rest. And that showed up in the game. It's one of the reasons why we, we won the national championship. And so I want to see evidence that the offensive line is practicing that way. Get into the game. I need to see that. Because if, if they don't do that, then the other guys on that offense are going to be playing behind a line that's not giving them a fair opportunity. 
Aiden Robbins uh, has 10 carries for 29 yards through two games. Uh, he didn't have a carry after the first quarter on Saturday. Certainly weird given that this guy had a lot of hype coming in. He seems to be a real talent at a thousand yard year at UNLV with what you think would be an inferior offensive line to BYU's this year. What do you make of what Aiden Robbins has done so far through two games? Uh, and that's been disappointing as well. And, and why that's happening is hard to say because it doesn't look like he's getting the holes in the first half when he's played that other guys have gotten in the second half. LJ Martin uh, has gotten in the second half and that's take nothing away from LJ. But to say that I expect Aiden Robbins to be much more effective than he's been, but it's a package deal. The, the line needs to open holes. He needs to hit those holes hard. And if there isn't a hole, he needs to make one. And he needs to take a, what is a one yard gain in terms of how the blocking turns out. He needs to turn it into a two or three yard gain because he's driving forward. You saw that from Tyler Algier all the time. You know, Coach Sataki talked a lot about intensity after the game. And I think uh, a, a ratchet up in intensity from both the runners and the blockers would help this team. Keaton Slovis was certainly impressive. 22 of 32 for 348, four touchdowns passing, one rushing. He has three rushing after zero rushing prior to this year. What do you make of Keaton Slovis's performance? See, that was the improvement from week one to week two that we want to see, isn't it? And so, yeah, I mean, he had a, a, a slow week one. Okay, I get it. It's the first time that in game action with a, with a new team and a new offense and new receivers to throw to. And in week two, what did Keaton do? He got a lot better. He elevated the people around him. Now, it helped to have Keanu Hill back. Welcome, Keanu. Not just back to the offense, but back to the end zone. That was wonderful to see. But you saw Keaton Slovis set the example as a leader for what everybody on this team, and especially everybody on this offense, needs to do. Get better week to week to week to week. He was accurate. He knew where he wanted to go with the ball. He had a better understanding of what his receivers could and could not do. And he was able to adjust his game to maximize what was there. And I expect that same jump from Keaton from this last game to the next one against Arkansas because they will certainly need it. The Razorbacks open as a 10-point favorite. That's a big line. BYU 2-7 and seven, uh, win a double-digit dog under Kalani Satake. This will certainly be a challenge. Arkansas put up 52 on BYU last year. Uh, perhaps the good news for BYU is that Rocket Sanders, the star running back for Arkansas, did not play last week, may not play this week. We'll see. It was a lot of K.J. Jefferson needed to beat Kent State on Saturday. What do you make of this matchup as BYU goes to the SEC? I think there's more opportunity here than I kind of thought in the offseason as I looked at the schedule. And that is because Arkansas right now is trying to put some things together themselves. You mentioned injury at running back. They've got three new starters on the offensive line. And last week against Kent State, they rotated through multiple guys to try to figure out their best offensive line. They didn't run the ball very well against Kent State. And so they're trying to get some things going as well. On the defensive side of the ball for Arkansas, last year they were one of the best sacking defenses in college football, but one of the worst at giving up passing yards. And in the first two games this year, they've kind of done the same things. They've gotten a bunch of sacks, but quarterbacks, especially the Kent State quarterback, had some success. He averaged about 10 yards per pass attempt. Now, that's not to say they can't play. It's just to say that they still have things that they need to uh, resolve on that Razorback defense. And BYU right now, it looks like the strength of the offense at this point in game three is going to be the passing attack. So the offensive line needs to be able to develop a running game because so much of what BYU's passing attack does is off of play action. But at the same time, there seems to be a bit of a vulnerability that BYU's offense might be able to exploit. And then on the offense uh, of Arkansas, main focus for BYU's defense has to be contain Keanu Hill on the ground. Slow down the pass rush, keep him in the pocket, make sure that he has to, to throw the ball from the pocket to beat you. Don't let him out to be a runner because if that happens, it'll be a long day. And it was a long day last year. Hopefully it's different this year. In the NFL, some notable standouts among the Cougars. Tyler Algier with two touchdowns was awesome, but Puka Nakua stole the show. I don't know how many fantasy waiver wires he's going to be in, but it's going to be a lot. 10 for 119, Trevor. That was quite the debut. Yeah, and it was a perfect storm for him. First of all, he's got the goods, right? I mean, we know he's that good at making plays and a versatile playmaker. But keep this in mind, too, that Rams quarterback Matthew Stafford's favorite receiver Cooper Cup is out for a month on injured reserve and 
Hukunakua and Cooper Cup are exactly identical in terms of their size and a lot of things that they're able to do. And so Stafford started to throw the ball to Puka and realized that, hey, Puka's making the play. I'll just keep throwing the ball to Puka. And all of a sudden, he now has filled that go-to spot that Cooper Cup filled for Matthew Stafford. So we'll see what happens next week. But this is a great opportunity with Cup out for a month for Puka to develop some continuity and some rhythm over the course of the next several games. And, of course, in college football, uh, Texas taking down Alabama was huge. Uh, we, we got some craziness already in week two, Trevor. We do. Texas goes to Tuscaloosa and shocks the football world. And it wasn't really that much of a shock for those who watch Texas. I mean, Texas has built line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball to compete at an SEC level. And you saw that against Alabama. Alabama wanted to physically pound Texas. They tried. They couldn't do it. And then you've got Colorado and Coach Prime, where brashness and, and confidence beyond belief has stepped up to the forefront to take the college football world college football world by storm as well. It's been an exciting start to the season for completely opposite reasons. Teams you love, teams you hate, coaches you're not quite sure what to think of. And I think all of it is, has began with so much wonderful drama, and it's just been a lot of fun. Football, it's the best, man. Trevor, we appreciate the time. Best of luck this week. Thanks, guys.